My name is Sarah Loveland, and I am from Michigan, which is in the United States. I grew up in a city called Ann Arbor with a very strong um, Christian Catholic family. I now live in Grand Rapids, which is about two, two and a half hours northwest of Ann Arbor, where I just graduated from university last April, and I now work as a nurse full time. Um, but yes, I grew up and we were a very strong um, household. We went to Mass every Sunday and we were also part of a Christian community that was ecumenical and was also charismatic. We had prayer meetings that we called gatherings. We went about once a month growing up and I did that until I was probably in high school or so when I branched off and did my own particular um, set of youth groups. I've, I've always believed in the Lord and I've always believed in my faith, um, but my struggle was always whether or not it was worth it or that was the type of life that I wanted to live. And so despite those difficulties and despite those trying times during my life, I still, I always went, even if I didn't have a prayer, prayer time or even if I didn't have a personal relationship with the Lord, I, I still always went to Mass. That was something that I couldn't, I couldn't shake and I didn't necessarily want to shake. When I started going to university when I was 18, I, my first year I was not a part of it. And then the Lord did a deep work of healing and of conversion in my heart toward the end of my first year. And um, in that summer between my first year and second year of university. And so I came back um, my second year and knew that I needed something. I couldn't, I couldn't do it on my own. I couldn't keep living a strong Christian life on my own and there was a UCO at my university and I was familiar with it or I was familiar with the community that sponsored it so I made a commitment that I would go once a week we had prayer meetings and talks and so I made a commitment that the very the very least the minimal I would do was I would go to to these once a week and and so I did that the community started um, I believe in the 1970s or so in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, it started with just a group of young people that came together and realized that they wanted to live a more radical expression of the Christian life. Um, and back when it started, it it grew, it was like an explosion of growth. Um, it went, they went from meeting in one small, like one small room in a house to like, you would have like, I mean, the whole house would be full and there'd be like a line out the door of people trying to come to these meetings. The goal is, um, well, there's several goals. The first one is that they're striving to emulate what the apostles lived and the first disciples lived and how they lived together and they ate together and they prayed together. Um, and there is a strong sense of unity in the Gospels when you read that. And that's something that is not seen or easily practiced in today's world um, with today's culture, um, which makes living the Christian life all the more difficult because um, human beings were made to relate. They were made to be in relationship with one another, um, especially if you're striving to live out a Christian lifestyle because we are innately weak and we have... Um, in innate faults and things like that. And so when you live with one another or close to one another and you support one another, then um, your brothers and sisters can not only call you out, but they can call you on and support and encourage you when you need that support and encouragement. So that is one of the goals, just to better live a Christian life. Um, the other one um, is to have unity. It's, it's sad that in today's world, Christianity is so broken up and there's many different facets of Christianity, many different, um, you have Catholics and Protestants and Orthodox um, <clears throat> and obviously that's not what the Lord intended. Um, so another facet of community is to bring those religions together so that we don't focus on what we have um, on the differences of our religion, but we choose to focus on the similarities of our religion and we choose to see one another as um, our brothers and sisters, despite the differences, um, and that 
um, my Protestant brothers and sisters and my Orthodox brothers and sisters are good um, men and women of God, and they can challenge and support me just as much as I can challenge and support them. As a, as a nurse specifically, um, the way in which I, I treat and I serve my patients, um, a lot of times you get a lot of difficult patients and most of the time you can't blame them because you're in the hospital and you're sick and you have no control over anything and I'm dictating when you take your medicine and what it's for and all these things and that's scary. But sometimes as a nurse when you have four to five patients and all of them are crying out or all of them need something or all of them are being difficult, um, it's sometimes a challenge not to talk about them with your fellow nurses because you need, a, you need an outlet and that's healthy but there needs to be boundaries about what that looks like and how you talk about it. Um, so in not um, talking negatively um, so much that it consumes a conversation and it's all negative about this patient and you forget <clears throat> that, oh, that is a human being, and that is a son, or that's a daughter of the Lord, and they deserve just as much dignity and respect as I do, um, maybe even more because of the vulnerable position that they're in, not on their own accord are they here. Um, just steering the conversation away from that or not participating in it as much, people notice those things and people want to talk about it. Um, or things such as whether or not I'm dating someone or people ask me about my ring a lot, which is a purity ring, and it's that I'm saving myself for marriage. Like all those are huge things that not a lot of people come across anymore and um, they're really taken aback. And it's a great opportunity to witness. Sometimes it's sad that so many people are so taken aback by it, but it's still a great opportunity to witness. I think one of the more moving times I had with a patient was um, he had come in for a change in consciousness. So he wasn't himself, he was confused, he didn't really know what was going on. Um, and he had just six weeks prior had brain surgery to remo remove meningiomas, so like tumors from his brain. And it was, he had been getting so much better and he had been having a lot of rehab and things had been going much better for him and then all of a sudden he got confused again. So they brought him back in and he wasn't, he wasn't necessarily acting out but he was restless and he was anxious and nothing would calm him down. He would keep calling out um, and it wasn't, you couldn't, it was more difficult to reorient him because something was going on in his brain and his body that he was confused. Um, and I noticed he was muttering something and it sounded a lot like the rosary so I was like are you Catholic and he was able to answer yes and um, so I said do you want me to pray the rosary with you and he said yes so I started leading and, and he would follow and we did that and he just settled down like completely like for the next the next couple hours or so so that was and it was really it was really powerful to be like I'm praying the rosary with my patient right now Different UCOs in different communities do outreaches in different ways. Um, one is just in people's own personal lives, um, finding similarities and um, foundations and relationships outside of community, um, and inviting people like, oh, you're Christian? Have you thought about this? Or have you heard about this? Do you want to come to a prayer meeting? Um, or do you want to come to... A lot of the times we just get together with one another and um, hang out or talk about things or play games. So those are situations that sometimes are easier to invite um, non-Christians or Christians that don't have um, a clear idea what community is or what it's for. Um, in UCO, a lot of times people go on things called prayer walks, in which they'll walk around the campus and they'll they'll pray for campus in certain things about that school in, in particular and other times they'll go for outreaches in which they'll go up to students or they'll go up to people walking around campus and say do you need prayer for anything or do you want to talk about anything. Um, there are things that they have called coffee stalls or things similar like that. It's with, when they just have like a table set up around campus and they offer free coffee or hot chocolate and that just 
um, is that's just a way to initiate a conversation like, oh, why are you giving out free coffee? <laughs> or why are you giving out free hot chocolate? What's going on here? And it just opens a door to talk about um, faith and, and what, what they're about, what, what we can offer. I don't think that I could live as well as I do without this community. And the reason it helps me do that, especially as a Catholic, is that um, not only is everyone supportive of my religion and the fact that I go to Mass every Sunday, if not more than every Sunday, and that I go to confession and have adoration, and if I was to tell a Protestant brother and sister that going to confession or going to adoration is really good for me, then they would make it a point to encourage me and to hold me accountable. Like, do you need to go to confession this week or do you need to go to adoration this week? Is that something that you need? Um, but it also, um, I really need to understand my faith better and be able to explain it um, to my brothers and sisters that aren't Catholic because they don't understand terms like adoration, which is just another old, another word for me because I grew up with it. But for my Protestant brothers and sisters, they don't understand that. So I need to be able to explain that um, so that they know what I'm talking about and that they can understand how that's helping me in my faith. Sometimes it's hard for me to find that line of, am I giving all of my life for the Lord? But I'm still very much living in the world. Um, but knowing that that is definitely what the Lord's calling me to do right now is to is to live in this world and not be a part of it and sometimes it's hard to see that I'm that though I'm living in it I'm I'm not a part of it and that I'm still being radical and that I'm still doing what he wants me to do and what he's calling me to do If you would like to participate in the next program of Cast Out Your Nets, sharing your testimony of apostolate and evangelization, visit our website at www.eukmommy.org for more information. Thank you.